you know, Kevin Estella does coffee and questions. I'm doing caffeine and questions. So I dropped this earlier today in my story and I said, hey, hit me with some questions. I've only done this once before. And I said, all right, no filter, which I'm not good with filter anyway, but um, it's extra no filter today, all right? So if you don't want the truth, then probably not the place for you, but I'll answer your questions as best I can. I have like 100 questions lined up and I'll try to get through them. Some will be longer than the others. Um, uh, oh God. Um, look, the UVL thing, I have a bunch of questions about the cops in, in the, the mass shooting. I don't know the facts. Until I know the facts, I'm not gonna weigh in. A lot of rumor, a lot of things bouncing around. And, uh, but until I know exactly what happened, I'm not even getting involved. I, I don't like jumping to the conclusions. Moving on. Um, speed drop versus uh, point blank zero, point blank zero for um, uh, five, five, six. That's the kind of what I like. I like to, to do the alternate zero and then I can do a uh, uh, use speed drop for 308 and above, 308, six, five, which is model board. But um, you know, th those types of runs, I use uh, speed drop, which is very easy to do. And then I generally use point blank zero, but there's no hard and fast. Look, everything I'm telling you now is an opinion. And it's an opinion based on my experience. And um, a lot of the questions are, what is your opinion on? And I like those questions because it's nothing but an opinion. Um, you know, as I try to figure out YouTube, <laughs> which I'm not doing very well, I, I look at all the videos out there and I see misinformation everywhere, okay? Now, the common belief is that if you have retired special operations or Navy SEAL or Green Beret, that you know everything and you absolutely do not. Um, but people like to pretend they do, and that doesn't sit well with me. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. And if I have an opinion, I'll tell you an opinion. Do you really think that, like if you ask me what's the best scope, do you really think I've got every scope that's out there? I haven't. I was privy to some information when I worked for Smod. I've shot some scopes, I worked at Sniper School. So I do have some knowledge in this area, but what I say may not be right, okay? And that kind of attitude has kind of bit me in the ass on social media because people don't want to hear that. They want to hear, this is what you do. This is what you do. This is what you do. And it doesn't sit well with me. And I'll never be that guy. So I'll tell you my opinion. I'll tell you based on my experience. But bear in mind, everything you hear on the internet is an opinion um, based on a snapshot of information, right? So if you, even if you spent 20 years in the military, in special operations, you were, you put your hands on a lot of things you have expertise in maybe one or two, maybe not at all. I spent 35 years in two different armies and special operations units. I don't have expertise in anything. I have a lot of base knowledge and a lot of experience, but to say I'm an expert, eh, I, I, I just don't uh, like that. All right, I had a couple of questions about officers, right? I had one from the Spanish army and I had one from the Irish army and cadets going in and I've bashed officers in the past. Um, let me tell you where that comes from. It comes from growing up in the Irish army, right? So in the Irish army, when they, they got their, when Ireland got their independence from, from England, they took all the British army stuff to include weapons and uniforms and drilling ceremonies. And they made the, the, the drill commands in Irish and all that. However, um, you would think a country that was subjugated by the British would kind of change the way the British did things. And uh, the old school way was the officers ran everything. They were the ones with the education and the grunts were just people to run into machine gun fire in World War I, right? And that has changed drastically, right? I remember sitting in a Bradley fighting vehicle in Kuwait in 1997 and I had a young officer arguing with th me and three other guys in, in the back of a Bradley fighting vehicle. And he said, I'm the one with the degree. And this other guy said, I have a degree too. And two other guys said, so do I. And he was stunned. He was shocked that they had a college degree, right? So your college degree doesn't freaking impress me, right? Um, I would not advocate getting rid of the officer corps and revamping everything. But in my opinion, you should have to do five years as an enlisted soldier before you're allowed to become an officer. It would give you a, a little bit of the hard knock school and humble you a little bit. Now, in the Irish army, everything was like the British army. If there was a class system there, I don't know if it's still like that. I suspect it is. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. When I was in the infantry, small base, right? C compared to the bases in America, right? I, I, I trained in Dundalk and I served in Dundalk for a couple of years and it's right on the border with Northern Ireland. 
Um, it was a company plus, I think. So uh, a company and a sub, half a sport company or something like that. And there was three mess halls there, right? And there was three different bars, right? Um, the mess hall is the chow hall, right? There was one for privates that NCOs didn't go into. And there was one, and the, the privates mess hall, the privates got their tray and they lined up and got their food like we do in America, in every single mess hall, right? The NCOs mess hall, the NCOs would go in and sit down and a private would come up with a menu and they'd tell them what's, what's on the menu and what the specials are and all this BS. And the officer's mess was just out of control, right? It was like upper class BS, right? And um, it, it, it just, it never sat well with me that you're an officer and you do, you know, oh, you have a college degree, great, good for you. Well, now you're, you know, 22 and you're in charge of everything. And I'm, I've been in the army for 15, 18 years. And all of a sudden, now the good officers come in and they try to learn. And it, it's, it's a hard balance for them because they, in the American army, they hammer officers, say, listen to your non-commissioned officers, listen to your non-commissioned officers. Well, I would say that's partly true. I would say, listen to your non-commissioned officers until you figure out they're full of shit, all right? Because there's fucked up NCOs, excuse my language, there's jacked up NCOs. And if you, if that little hairs in the back of your head go, this does not make sense, then you need to be a leader and take charge, all right? And I'll give you an example. Nate Self was one of my first platoon leaders in the army in Germany. Um, he went on to be the ranger commander on Roberts Ridge. When they went in and the helicopter got shot up and he took, he lost four of his rangers and he took charge. The guy's a freaking hero. Um, phenomenal officer, right? I remember the day he showed up to be our platoon leader and we were having a, a T, uh, platoon meeting and I was an E5 at the time, a sergeant, and one of the E6s, we were all going in with, with the E7, you know, platoon sergeant. And Nate Self went to go in and this E6 said, no, sir, this is NCOs only. And Nate said, no, it's not. I'm coming in. Get out of my way. And I was like, oh, damn, this guy's not screwing around, right? So listen to your NCOs. If you understand that they're squared away and they, there, there's this relationship between them, which I've always had a good relationship with off, junior officers, right? Senior officers, a whole different story. I've always had a good relationship with junior officers because we all understood our roles, right? When I was an NCO, the platoon leader had a great relationship, right? Um, I've mostly had good officers. When I was a team sergeant, I had great captains who were my team leaders and majors. And we had both had our roles and we mutually supported each other. Um, in the American Army, we've created a system now where as you climb the ladder as an officer, if, if you're a, a major or lieutenant colonel, if you don't make a grade in your evaluation at a certain level, only, only some people are above the line and some are below the line. If you're below the line repeatedly, they'll kick you out, right? So you could have 15 years in the army and you, they'll kick you out, no pension, nothing. And you have a family support. So it, on the surface, it, it seems like a good way to get rid of shitty officers, right? But what we've created is, is a, a culture of yes men. Some yes men are born and some are made. And you can make yes men as a leader by forcing them to, to never question what you do. So what's happened is that system has gotten rid of some shitty officers. It's also crushed really good officers who didn't, who didn't toe the line and do what they were told blindly and just say, freaking screw them in, I'm going to climb the ladder. So when they fought and fought and fought, they got reevaluated below the line and they got kicked out of the army, right? So... There are second and third, third order effects to having those types of systems in place. Um, but I, I think in the, I know, in the Irish Army, it was, I think, give me another story from the Irish Army. I go on for this for hours. I got a hundred questions to get through. However, in the Irish Army, when I was in Lebanon the first time in 1987, we had a platoon in a house in a place called Tibnine in South Lebanon. Now we were, we were doing guard on the house. We were in checkpoints, we were in patrols, and we were working pretty hard. Um, I remember I was in a room with six other privates and there was absolutely no room that you could, there was no room for your bag. Like it was like the, the, the accommodation on a submarine or something, right? It was none, shit was everywhere and mosquito nets and all that. The officer, the platoon leader had a room that you could fit 15 people in all to himself with a, with a, a balcony, a big, huge table, his desk, his bed. Now, the officer we had was actually considered to be squared away, right? 
However, it would, did not even dawn on him to walk into that room and go, no, let's put 10 men in here and I'll take that little room downstairs. Wasn't even a thought because that's how he'd been raised and that's the culture he was brought up in. So I would challenge you as an officer, if you do something like that and it just doesn't make sense, then make the change yourself. I was going to uh, Afghanistan, I think, in know, four, and we were traveling, a bunch of us, and the com we, we stopped at an Air Force base. Now, the Air Force played this game big with officers and NCOs, and we had to stay there overnight. And our company commander, who was freaking solid, he became a group commander later on, I'm not gonna mention his name, um, he said, okay, uh, you know, he checked into this, it's kind of a hotel and they're like, well, you have to stay over here and your NCOs have to stay here and, and we don't have privates in, in SF. And he was like, no, we're all staying together. And he went and he stayed with the NCOs and, and they were shocked that he would do this. You know, I have a hundred stories like this. I would say as a young leader and as a young officer, don't buy into the bullshit that's been around for hundreds of years. Okay. There was a time when it made sense. It doesn't make sense anymore. And your freaking group sergeant major in third group has a master's degree, you know what I mean? So, so stop throwing education out and listen to the good NCOs and, and make your common sense decision if it does not make sense with the others. All right, moving on. Um, do you think iron sights are necessary on rifles with optics? I don't generally run backup iron sights. Um, I did when I was going to war because if you're stuck on the side of a mountain in Afghanistan and your optic goes out and you have to go to iron sights to, to engage, different, any gun I have here, I don't bother because there's only so much real estate on that rail. And uh, personally, I don't bother, okay? Uh, is it called C4 or serious putty? I, I guess you're talking about explosives. I guess it is. Um, wait or not wait, not talking about that. Going to Virginia. I haven't found anywhere to train in Virginia. Um, we're bouncing around all over the place. Uh, initially, we were, we're hammering training. Now we've pulled back a little bit. The goal is to get to more places less often. All right. So if you have a place in your state and you want us to come, email training at Fieldcraft Survival and give us the name of the range, right? Um, if it's something like personal security or medical training, obviously we need a classroom. For personal security, you need a classroom, ideally like some sort of shoot house to run scenarios and an outside area to run scenarios at a car, okay? Um, do the Irish even have a filter? Not so much. I, I'm bad and not having a filter and being very passionate has bitten me in the ass many, many times over the last couple of years. Um, uh, do you think the training you got in the Irish Army brought a different dynamic to the U.S. Army? I I think so. So, so I it was kind of it must have been weird. Like even in basic training, and somebody asked me about basic training. I was twenty nine, right? And the, the the all the kids that are eighteen or nineteen, right? Just graduated high school, and they were calling me pops. Now twenty nine is not old by any stretch of the imagination. But um, being older and being more mature, that's why I've, I've told people who wanted to get in the army later, hey, I'm thirty one. Am I too old? You're not, because once you even at the next rate program, you go to your team, your, your, your age and your maturity will set you apart from other kids, right? And, and let's be honest, until you're 25, you're a freaking kid. As a, as a man, women are more mature, but I was a train wreck until I was about 25, and I still am in some ways. Um, so the things I learned in the Irish Army really stood to me, right? I had great discipline, I had great training, I, I served in a great unit, and it, it really helped me. I went to Lebanon, no, I went to... Um, Kuwait in 1997 when I was a private and I could speak almost enough Arabic from being in Lebanon <laughs> twice that people were like oh my freaking god right I understood Arab culture more than anybody else I understood rules of engagement at that time before 9-11 the American military never carried live ammo anywhere except they loaded it on the range and shot it there was almost like they were scared of the, the, the gun that's different now but I've been carrying out live ammo so much on the northern Ireland border and stuff like that I, I end up briefing, well, when we were in guard duty in the middle of the desert, I end up briefing everybody on rules of engagement because nobody knew anything about it. Um, so it really, really did help and stand to me. And of course I was more mature and I was older and I could understand the game, but obviously seven years in the military in Ireland was going to help me um, in the American military. Um, it's funny because when we went to Afghanistan and we started, and Iraq especially, we started dealing with um, IEDs. I, I, I knew a lot about IEDs, been dealing with them for years. We didn't call them IEDs, we call them roadside bombs and booby traps, but I, I had a whole lot of information that a lot of people didn't have. 
um, hoping to write a book. I'm not a book guy. I, I don't think I'll ever write a book. My goal is to do YouTube videos and do chapters, right? I'll just talk like this and I'll talk about my youth, right? And then I'll do another video and I'll talk about joining the Irish Army and serving in the Irish Army and all that. And what, what happens with me is I drink a lot of coffee and I, I, one thing triggers another and I think of a story and I, I just, if I, if I signed a contract for a hundred grand today for a book in a year, it would crush me. The stress would, would destroy me and um, I, I don't work well like that. I, I just don't. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not very self pub published. I'm not good at pushing myself. I don't know what the word I was looking for there. Um, so I, it's better if it comes up naturally in a story. When I'm, ta I'm a talker, man. I'm a talker. I'm a storyteller. Writing shit down and I'm trying to organize thoughts like that. Not good for me. Um, what's your opinion on the current ARW? I don't know. I am detached from it. However, my my relationship with the ARW is with about four or five guys that I've met periodically over the years at sniper competitions, right? So I was at the International Sniper Competition years ago, and there was guys there from the range of wing, and they, that, I mean, they're a different generation, they're much younger than me, so, um, you know, we talked and, and chatted and all that. Um, and then I invited them to, to the Special Operations Sniper Competition, and they came, and they got crushed, and that's okay. Because if you're afraid, and there are units in the American military and special operations who rarely shoot that comp because they're afraid to show themselves up. And that's a childish attitude, right? So they came and got crushed, and the next year, they knew what to work on. And they went back, and they, they came back and got, did a little better, or came back, did a, and they've gotten better and better and better over time. I think the Irish person is a good soldier. He has that warrior culture in him. I think the guys there are there for the right reason. And just think about this, right? There's not, I don't know what the Ranger Wing do in Mali right now. I think they work for a government that's super risk averse. However, you know, I, a guy told me the other day that for the first time ever, the census is gonna come out and that the population of Northern Ireland is, is higher for Catholics than Protestant for the first time in hundreds of years, probably. Now, imagine if the British said, I'm done with, Nor we're done with Northern Ireland, we're pulling out. Overnight, the Ranger Wing would be in a whole different world. And with loyalist paramilitaries, with freaking, that chaos would be all theirs, right? And the emergency response unit, the cops, if they're not training for that, they're, they're really missing the boat. Anybody I know from the Ranger Wing is a freaking rock star, man. They're great soldiers, they're nice guys, they're humble, they're hardworking, and, but I don't know a lot of guys, right? Most of the guys I was there with are, are, have moved on. Um, so again, I, 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 I can only say what I, what I know. Well, you offer pistol rifle classes in Vero Beach, Florida. If so, come in. I don't know what's there for ranges. The place we did personal security last month does not have a life fire range and it has limited facilities even for personal security. So I, I don't know. Sean Kirkwood runs all the tactical training here. Sean Kirkwood is a fifth group guy, Silver Star recipient in Iraq. Sean's a freaking rock star and a super humble guy. And he's the guy that you wouldn't, you'd pass by and not know. But Sean's a freaking awesome guy and he manages all the tactical stuff. So you worked in the Naval Service, I did. The first course I ever did, the question was, did you work with the Naval Service whilst in the Ranger Wing? Yes. The first course I did, actually maybe the second, I think the first course when I graduated was methods of instruction, teaching you how to teach, which I think is super smart. And then we went to the Naval Base in Hall Bowline, Cork, and I did like a two or three weeks naval course, right? Because at the time, we were the special ops for the Navy as well. I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, we learned boat handling, knots, naval terminology, all that, and it was kind of fun. But other than that, working with the Navy, um, other than, uh, you know, going out to offshore rigs and, and doing some beach landing stuff, not that much. Um, as far as I know, mostly what they do is fishery protection, but I might be wrong. Um, uh, uh, all this stuff about active shooter and all that, I'm just leaving it alone because 
emotions are too high. There's too many people with opinions in there. Somebody asked me a question earlier on about active shooter. I'm not a guy, right? Military special forces don't train an active shooter. Police officers do. SWAT teams do. Ask the people who know. There's tons of people running their mouth on social media about things they know nothing about, and I'm not going to be one of them. Um, now, if you ask me my opinion, I will tell you, but um, yeah, um, things you miss about Ireland. <laughs> uh, oh, there's a good one. Thoughts on the new M4 replacement. All right. So again, no filter, right? Um, I was in force mod when the army come up with this requirement. So I don't doubt that SIG built a phenomenal rifle. I just, I questioned the requirement, right? The M4 carbine has just met maturity. It's a phenomenal, and I know where the requirement came from, and I can't, I can't talk about it here because I don't know if it's public knowledge. So I've kind of recused myself because I was, I, I, I was privy to some classified information early on. I will tell you that the acquisitions process is, is rotten to the core, okay, in the army, in the government, right? But here's the difference between special operations acquisition and army acquisition. In the special operations, at least theoretically, uh, it doesn't always work like this, but most of them, the requirements are fed up from the bottom, right? An ODA says, oh my God, we were in this thing, we didn't have this, and here's the requirement. And it's written and it's pushed up through the force mod office where I worked, and it goes all the way up. Now, after it leaves me at SF Command, no more soldiers touch it. It's acquisitions officers and contractors and you know civilians, right? So it goes all the way up from us to USASOC, Army Special Operations Headquarters, and then it goes to so calm and it gets worked and worked and worked, but it's bottom up driven. And that's the point. Army programs are top down driven. People in the army like Millie, who's a piece of shit, let's be honest, is uh, he says, I want this new gun. And there was a big teleconference years ago. And uh, Millie was like, he was laying out the thing for this gun, probably six years ago. And he said, I want this gun. And he said, how long will it take? And the people who knew said five years. And he said, not good enough. I want it done in a year. And they say, yes, sir. And um, they knew he'd be gone, and so they just tell him what he wants to hear, okay? So dropping billions of dollars on a new rifle that maybe is an incremental improvement, I don't know, um, when we have soldiers with no night vision goggles, right? Um, I, I, I don't, I love when they give soldiers new stuff for on the ground, they don't spend millions of dollars on new freaking satellites and all that stuff that, that, that they, when I was in Force Mod, the, the requirements that came from the teams where guns, bullets, optics, trucks, radio, stuff that's in my truck in the desert in Africa, right? The stuff I need. The requirements that came from the group commanders were completely different. It was big drones, big communication stuff, stuff that they could micromanage these guys with. It's completely different. As far as I was concerned, I worked for the guy in the truck and not the group commander, and, and I had a lot of problems because of that. So I don't doubt that SIG built a phenomenal rifle based on the requirement. I just questioned the requirement, okay? Um, but that, again, that's purely my opinion. Um, uh, mm, mm. Ukraine, I don't, I don't track Ukraine much. I, I see a little bit of it here and there. I, I just don't. Um, and again, I told you no filter and you might not like what I say. I, near the end of my army career, I was a freaking news junkie. I was in the news all day, every day, and it was driving me crazy. I just don't bother anymore. You have two or three or four news agencies who have decided to split the country in two and we'll feed these guys with the stuff they want to hear and we'll feed these people with the stuff we want to hear and we'll keep them all angry and we'll keep them all fighting with each other i just don't freaking bother with it right ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries in europe okay uh sending them 40 billion dollars um so it could get filtered back into bank accounts like nancy like people like nancy pelosi i i just i i i, I stay away from it i i um you know, I would much rather see them use $40 billion in America because we damn sure need it. Um, mm -hmm. Opinion on the Navy and Ireland, I don't know, man. Other than what I what I dealt with. Uh, where's George? George quit um, to move on to other things. Now, why he quit, you'd have to ask him that because that's personal to him and I'm not going to get into his personal business. Um, uh, some of these are kind of repetitive. Uh, Ways to get into training people without being in law enforcement or prior military. Honestly, to me, a good trainer is a good trainer. I like, like in Fieldcraft, we have some law enforcement, we have some military, but we have straight up civilians. 
okay? Um, it depends what you're talking about, what type of training. It's hard to have credibility. It, here's the difference, right? If you're teaching shooting, the first time I went to Todd Hodnett's Long Range Shooting Academy, Todd Hodnett, Accuracy First, if you don't know, is the freaking sniper Jesus. Like, he is the most knowledgeable guy in long range shooting I've ever taken training from, right? But the first thing Todd said when he was training my special forces team back in 2004, I think, um, he said, I'm not a sniper. I am a long range shooter. I'm not here to teach you tactics. I'm here to teach you how to shoot, right? And that's the delineation, right? If you have never been in a gunfight, you really don't have any business teaching people about gunfights, right? However, you can teach about competition shooting. Competition shooting is shooting fast and accurate under pressure. That's kind of like combat, right? But that's the delineation. You can be a phenomenal trainer, and they're some of the best trainers I've ever trained with. I've never been in the military or the police department, but they're really, really good at what they do, but they do cut that line. Because when, when you try to blur that line, you somewhat lose credibility. Um, when was the last time we were in Dundalk? Yeah, 2014. My dad was sick. He was dying and I went back. Haven't been back since. Um, coolest place you've ever deployed? <sighs> I deployed in some dumps, like really bad. I tell you, here was one place I was in. I, I, I can't really talk about what I was doing. I was in Oman one time and we went to a place called Wadi Shab which you should look up on YouTube. It's a phenomenal place where you walk through this water with big freaking you know, canyons on each side and you go through and you, you go on in underwater and up into this underground cave and it was phenomenal. It's actually a really beautiful country and very, very unspoiled. Thoughts on 1911 ACP? I think it's too big. I have a 1911, I love it. Um, I just got this thing and uh, we have a relationship with SIG. I'm not even sure what this is but um, what the relationship is, not the gun, but this is a, a 6R320 X5 Legion, okay? It is a phenomenal gun. It's actually built for competition, and it, I've not shot it today. It's, it, it, it's really, really nice, but I wouldn't carry it. It's too big. I'd sooner carry this, which is like its little baby brother, um, SIG 365X with a red dot on it, and I bought this one, I um, actually bought it from my from my daughter, um, but with the red dot on it like that for about I think it was like less than eight hundred bucks. So this is a good option, and I'm not pushing Sig. Um, this is a good option for somebody that wants to buy a good carry gun uh, with a red dot already on, because uh, in in a stressful situation you're not going to see those sights. Now you may superimpose that red dot over the top. And if you're focused on the front side post, you're blurring out the target. And you need to see hostile intent before you drop the hammer on somebody, right? Um, so this gives you the opportunity to shoot with both eyes open, be aware of your surroundings, and determine hostile intent before you, 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 you know, fucking take a human life. Um, I really like this. It's really nice to shoot. And it's really accurate. Um, mm, Favorite beer? I don't drink. Um, Mike talked about retiring a few times. Will you take the CEO role if you're... <laughs> no and no, okay? Michael, anybody knows Mike knows Michael never retire. It's not in his DNA. Mike can hardly take a day off. And if Mike did, I would not be his first choice for CEO. I guarantee you that. Um, the way things are going, do you see the US in the Civil War? I don't know, man. I, I hope not, but things are going pretty bad here. And I, I will tell you that all the chaos that went on in 2020, that's coming back, okay? It's a proven political sta uh, tactic to win elections, to divide the American public and scare them, okay? So all the riots and all the freaking BS that was going on in 2020, that is coming back in 2024. And that's not the time to seek training. Now's the time to seek training. I'm not just saying that to get you to train, but when all that, in 2020, we would post a class that would sell it months in advance. Um, now, uh, classes are not filling because people feel safe. But when all these riots start again, um, it, it, it's going to get bad again because they, 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 they understand that it's a tactic, okay? Um, your next podcast appearance. Uh, I got a couple of podcasts in the queue, but um, because Fieldcraft only posts a podcast a week, 
and Mike does them and a bunch of other people do them, that, that the queue is massive. So I'm going to do podcasts on my YouTube channel from now on. So it will be a video podcast. And I'll tell you, I had a, a young Irish guy come in uh, the other day. I mean, him talk for like an hour. And my wife was like, oh, my God, you have to do a podcast. Uh, born in America, grew up in Ireland, um, very close to the border like I did, but kind of 20 years behind me. So um, I'm kind of outdated with, with tracking stuff in Ireland, but he's very, very current. So we, and we fed off each other very, very well. And we're gonna sit down, we're gonna talk about Ireland and we're gonna talk about the troubles. And uh, it's funny, you know, some, some poets said that the Irish treat a, a joke like a serious thing and a serious thing like a joke, right? So if you make a joke at the wrong guy in a bar now and you're gonna get punched in the face, right? Um, and, and they treat a serious thing like a joke, like calling the war in Northern Ireland to kill thousands and thousands of people. That's the troubles, right? World War II was the emergency, right? Let's, let's, let's back up. Well, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about Northern Ireland and the IRA and the troubles and you know, all that piece. And I think it's going to be really educational for me as well. Um, the, oh God, uh, uh, did your experience in the air always stand for you, Vanessa? Of course it did, absolutely. Um, Irish whiskey, don't drink. Um, about to start rocking a prayer for military. I, look, I, I, ran a, I ran a soft prep course here last year and I brought in a physical therapist, a strength and conditioning coach. I brought in nutritionalist in and, and we did it. And the, the physical therapist worked that group for years and she would tell you, don't rock. Don't rock for training. Build your stamina in other ways because you're gonna get injuries. Carrying a freaking 80 pound rock in your back is not good for your body. You will beat your body down enough. Um, I would carry le lesser weights. And um, if you look back through my Instagram, uh, probably, I don't know when it was, when it got pretty last summer, um, you'll see some posts about that soft prep course and you'll find the, I think it's like Elite Physio. You'll find her Instagram and you can hit her up with questions. But somebody asked at the time, should I be rocking? And she was like, no, you're, you're going to create injuries and you don't need it. Uh, you build your strength and conditioning in other ways. Like I will tell you that after being in the military for a very long time, I have a ton of injuries. Um, I have two bulging discs on my neck. I have TBI. I have a uh, fractured back. Both my rotator cuffs are torn and my, I have really bad plantar fasciitis from running too much and rocking too much. My knees are shot. And I, it all builds up, right? You've got plenty of time to destroy your body once you're in. Um, what's the most important skill set you have? Good Lord, man. I don't know. Do I have any skills? I don't have any skills. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's a hard one. I'll have to come back to that one. Mm. Um, mm. Mm. On an air 10. 308 looking for more kick Billy out to 1500 yards 300 wind mag at 338 I'd go 300 wind mag because uh, ammunition's less and uh, 338 people won't let you shoot on the ranges because you'll destroy their steel inside freaking 500 uh, what's a skill you want to learn I want to take life not so freaking serious like look at me look it's Memorial Weekend I put that thing out and I'm like oh god I gotta go answer these questions I want to I want to freaking relax. I, I think I got a year left maybe and I just want to go live in a freaking cabin. Um, the, can anyone in OSIP believe you were already a senior NCO? They did actually because um, when I went to basic, I was 29. I'd already been in the Irish Army for seven years and I stood out. As much as I tried to blend, I stood out and they started talking to me and for some reason, Somalia came up and I'd been in Somalia for like nine months and two of my NCOs were in Somalia. So once we talked about that, we broke rapport. They were actually really good to me in basic training. I don't think I ever once did push-ups on my own, right? When everybody in mass punishment was getting punished, everybody did push-ups. But at me on my own, they left me in charge most of the time. And uh, they were actually pretty cool. Um, oh God. Uh, Will you do any classes in Kentucky? I'd love to. Need locations. It's freaking hard. It's a lot of legwork finding these new locations. Um, I don't know what turmoil is going on in AFSOC Command. I, I, I don't know, honestly. Um, 
What are some qualities you respect in military and civilian leaders? Mm. I, look, I, I, I'm a certain type of leader that doesn't, doesn't work well with others sometimes, and I'll admit that. However, I, I have a low tolerance for BS and I have no tolerance for laziness, and, and it's okay to make mistakes, but um, let's learn from them and move on, right? Um, I, I think good leaders um, empower their subordinates and then hold them accountable, okay? Um, I, will, I will give you the latitude to make decisions and do your freaking job, but I will hold you accountable for those decisions. And it's okay to make mistakes as long as we keep, don't keep making the mistakes like, like that, right? But you can only do that if you're willing to hold people accountable and holding people accountable in the civilian world is not popular. I'll tell you that right now. Um, is a common first time class goers to be a little nervous? Absolutely, why not? Absolutely. However, I, I think we have phenomenal instructors and they will walk you through step by step. So we're in the process now of making videos like this about every class where we will say, this is what you need, this is what you should bring, this is what the class is about. Because it's very hard to explain that in a caption on, um, on, on, a, on a posting, right? So. Um, you're not gonna get thrown in the deep end. You're not gonna freaking, this is not the military, right? You are a student, you're also a customer. So we will treat you right. It's okay to be nervous. People get very nervous in personal security, right? We do, we go through all the rules and all that. And then we go into scenarios and I'll be like, who's freaking out? And I'll get half the class. I'll be like, why? Calm down, it's okay. But once you do it, you gain that confidence, you feel so much better. Um, yes, it's normal to be nervous, but we don't throw you in the deep end. We walk you step by step. Um, uh, 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 training, put it, uh, action, I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, you choose nine millimeter over a training area. So, uh, the, the question is, you choose nine millimeter over 45? Well, uh, yes, I would choose nine millimeter. Look, we went in a big circle, right? We were like 45 or 38 and 45, and 357 Magnum and nine mil and 10 mil and we're back to nine mil. If you don't know what to carry, look at what cops carry. Look at the military carries. Delta Force carry nine mil. Special operations carry nine mil. It's a good all round bullet, good magazine capacity, and it has some good stopping power for what it's used for, okay? Um, What's a day in the CRIF like? <laughs> Especially anything that I think the CRIF has changed now. It's been redirected. I don't know if that's public knowledge. I think it is. Um, the stuff that me and Mike did in the, the CRIF is the Crisis Response Force. When me and Mike were in, it was the CIF, the Commanders and Extremist Force. The stuff we did in Iraq in like 2005, 2006, 2007 is very unique and it probably never come back again. Maybe, okay? Um, so a typical day, 10 freaking... 15 years ago is not a typical day now. So I don't know how to answer that. Generally, you train a lot. You train, you train, you train, you cross train people, you cross train, and you're always, always, always training. When it comes to training, you will not, like if it comes to an emergency, you will not rise to the occasion, you will fall to your level of training. That's why your level of training has to be really, really high. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Are you enjoying retirement with your family? Absolutely, and I found um, working in the civilian world to be challenging at times, but um, the uh, it, it's been great. It really has. Um, uh, let me see. Love my time in Florida. It was awesome. Mm. <laughs> Can I offer you whiskey in exchange for coming on my podcast? Uh, I don't drink, man. Um, uh, what are something that the Irish Rangers are more proficient at than the Grand? I don't know, man. I, I tell you, European armies are very, very good at fieldcraft, right? Um, the, uh, <laughs> oh, somebody, somebody wrote, do you use one or two phone books to sit in your sprinter van? 
And then yeah, I looked at it's Rosie Kabar. Well played, Rosie Kabar, who's like a foot shorter than me. Um, or was I? It's something the Irish Rangers. So when I went, <laughs> when I was a sniper instructor at Special Forces Sniper School, I um, uh, went back to Ireland and I went to the Ranger Wing to an international counter-terrorist sniper course. And I, I tell you, uh, the fearcraft portion, the stalking, the observation tests, and all that piece was uh, was pretty freaking difficult and well done. So I think they were very good at that. But again, I, I, there's, there's a huge time difference. Um, how much do you charge for mentoring millennials? What do you miss about Ireland? There's two questions, man. I don't charge anything for mentoring people if I can help, especially younger people. Um, what do you miss about Ireland? The food, I think. Um, do Irish people respect Conor Brown? I have no idea. Um, uh, favorite thing to do with your dog? Man, my dog is awesome. He goes everywhere with me. He's with me 24-7. Um, I don't have a Mark. Somebody's like, can you do more videos with the Mark 22 ASR? I don't have one. I borrowed one for the video I did with Grand Thumb, but I don't have one, and I damn sure not buying one. Um, whew, whew. All right. I think I got through most of them. I jumped over some. If I didn't answer your question, I just it, it, it came up multiple times. Um, the... Like I said, a lot of active shooter stuff. Look, you wanna ask people who are experts in active shooter? Rosie Kerbar, um, Matt, Matt with Kirsten who works with us, Matt Vandy, David Acosta, Matt Shea, all those guys are SWAT cops who've dealt with this for years and years and years. Um, they're the people that give you guidance. Um, mm, All right, so um, last thing, this this is obviously a YouTube video and this is gonna be my outlet for a lot of stuff. Um, I might do more of these depending on the feedback and, but I, my goal is to be different than everybody else. And I, I'm a little different because I don't give a shit about how many subscribers I have or how many followers, I don't care, right? So my goal is to give good base level educational knowledge um, for people, right? If you if you're trying to learn CQB and you don't know how to put on the tourniquet, your your priority is kind of jacked up, honestly. Um, good level, good base level uh, medical stuff, um, basic 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 skills that people should know. That's my goal, and um, you know. So if that's what you want, then this will be a good resource for you because everybody else is doing all the high speed cool Gucci shit, and I don't care about that. Okay, all right. Uh, that's about it. I'm sure the questions are going to keep coming in. And if I get more, I'll just answer them online. Okay. Thank you.